thank you very much for this warm welcome. Um, I don't talk about triad, I uh, talk about the subject beyond creativity. You gave me 20 minutes more or less and after that you might have a chance to to see how we work, what we do, just by this one example of the museum here. Um, 20 minutes is not enough to talk about creativity as a whole and today we have a, a guest from London here, Charles Laundrie is here, over here. I'm very pleased that you're here this morning. Thank you for coming. Um, to come at 8.30 in Berlin to a place and to listen to somebody, it's a, it's a task. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for all of you that you came. And, Beyond creativity, it's a provocation what I like to do. Um, I like to talk about some things um, which we all do every day. We are creative, we um, think uh, beyond borders, beyond systems, um, but uh, we at the same time, I think we should consider the whole. And that's what I tried to do this, this morning. And I know that's going to be streamed uh, somewhere in the world, so I think there could be a little signal from Berlin um, and um, I'd like to provoke that for a moment. I start with an old um, vision of creativity and it's a time after the Second World War and it's Disney. And I start with Living in spacious, well-planned communities. <laughs> this is uh, more or less 60 years ago and uh, you see autonomous driving was already very vivid at that time. But you also saw that little bullet. And the bullet is actually military. And uh, the motivation behind this whole thing was to go uh, into a geo, uh, geopolitical navigation system. That was actually the basic reason uh, why Disney and the military system worked together already at that time. Um, I make a big jump into our time. This is um, the latest aesthetics and this is the latest form of how we mix the world, how we see maybe fragments of it and how we are confronted with such a complexity. Um, I, like to t I've s I brought three questions this morning. One is, what should global creative community be ready for in the future? Second, how can creativity become a part of the global transformation, which we are already at some point? And third, Creativity, for what, who, and why? And if you go into something like a first ownership model of who, who actually owns the world, the latest um, numbers, and I didn't make this up, it's by the global wealth distribution data and Credit Suisse is behind that. Eight people own the same wealth as 50% of the whole world. And for a lot of companies and a lot of owners behind the companies we work for, um, they belong to the eight people. So we should always consider who are the owners of our creativity, who are the owners of our ideas. These are the sirens of the Greek mythological. You know those things, maybe. Um, it was quite seductive at that time and Odysseus had to really to, to close everything not to be seduced. We actually, in our world, we open up everything of ourselves to be seduced. Because the new sirens are Amazon, Apple, and Google changed its name, its alphabet in the meantime. And behind that, there are a lot of other companies, Facebook. And the ideas which sort of get um, blown from the startup company, they actually go more and more into this uh, system which is above, and not anymore so much into the old economy. So that's a big change. We are part of it. So the new global sirens are the new, is actually representing the new global ownership model. Why is that so? Because uh, in, in USA, there are in the meantime more than 500 companies working on artificial intelligence, whereas in Germany there are only 10, and in England 60. It's the latest number done by a research institute in Düsseldorf. So those specialists work on an amount of data which is um, sort of for the next 20 years decisive for any form of um, communication and also maybe political implications. We don't know yet. 
right now the guys who started this whole thing from Facebook, from Google, they seem to be good guys. You know, they wear t-shirts and they uh, stand around and they smile and they look like we at some point. But there's a system behind. And the system can be autonomous from the founders. And this is a world system we are talking about right now. So the creativity, which we do actually, is completely part of the big machine. And we all know that, we are fascinating by Matrix and other, and other, and other films. And uh, we maybe might forget that this big machine is absolutely responsible for any form of globalization, the whole idea of growth, and the 24-hour speed worldwide. And I don't know who of you is completely addicted. I gave up my iPhone right now. I wanted to show it to you. Who's addicted to the iPhone? Who sleeps with the iPhone in the bed? Who is sort of waking up in the morning, checks the first messages, and so on and so on. So we are more or less part of this every day, and the speed is doing something to us. My thesis is speed, if you do too much of it, and you don't decelerate, um, you get ill. You get simply ill. And maybe Berlin is a place where you get less ill because you don't have to pay so much money for rent as in London, New York or Shanghai. But uh, still, I think that's, that's the point. This kind of global machine is more or less the triggered by algorithms. Algorithms is a new language of the future. Algorithms is something which only a very few people understand because you need a very special task for that. You have to be at least informed, you have to study information design or mathematics or something like that. But the psychology behind that, everybody knows. That's the reason why we love Facebook or we like our iPhone and like to chat and get in contact with other people it has to do with archaic psychological fragments. And everybody has that. That's actually the basis why Facebook is so important. It's about narcissism, it's about the way of friendship, it's love, it's beauty. Hey, good morning, you're very beautiful this morning. You like this? If you look into the mirror in the morning, you maybe mm, start to consider certain things, at least me. Um, so the psychology of the machine is behind this whole trigger moment, and I think we should um, uh, not forget that. Whoever has read Dave Eggers' The Circle um, knows what is the motivation behind this whole thing. And uh, The Circle is something I really recommend to read. Although after 200 pages, this becomes a little bit boring because you know the, the end of, this, of, of, of the book. But the, uh, the motivation in, 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 in the drama is something which more or less represents uh, what's going on in Palo Alto. And I just give you some, some numbers here. Uh, one is that uh, I would like to tell you that 2000, 2003 was a moment where the analog signs and the digital signs were even. That was the last moment of our history that we had more or less more written books, science in books, and compared to digital science in our digital world. From that moment on, the whole thing went into the other direction. And I give you some numbers here. For instance, 2003, it took 13 years to, um, to get into the human genome. The same amount of data uh, would take, would, would, it would take them today one day to do that. So the amount of, 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 of mass uh, data information is extremely. We have 50 billion sensors around the world who are more or less are in contact with us. We don't even know them. But they do something with us. They, they sort of measure us. They, are with us all the whole time. And they don't do only something with us, they do something with the system. And we should just consider that. I think some of you are from the advertisement background or from other creative uh, companies. And uh, you, we are all part of that whole, whole thing. And my question is actually, who schemes the added value? That's an old question, Charles. It's Mehrwert theory. It's Marxism, actually. Um, who makes the decision and has access to the strategies? I think nobody here in this room. Who defines possibilities? Maybe some of us. And um, my question is here. Is the creative community ready for the new class war? 
because I think there is a new slavery going on at some point. If you look into big pictures of Gursky and others um, who um, sort of do the snapshots of China PC working spaces and also American PC working spaces, um, you, you see the new slavery. It looks cool, but it's 12 hours very hard work and you get bad eyes after that. As soon as we are out of the box, our so-called offices, creativity, we have to face 2017. And we have new facts. And we have some, now, some new realities. And this is the current reality. And it's pretty cruel. And sometimes when, we, when I sit over my little coffee or I read the newspaper or look into the, some news, I think, okay, I'm so happy to be in Berlin. I'm so happy to be here because there's so much peace. But there's so much war around us. And when we do sort of the latest creativity for Pampers or for or a little Mars or something, some goodies or bonbons or so, uh, we have to face that we have this kind of reality 2017. We have 67 wars somehow in this world and 758 um, military guerrillas or terrorist um, interaction groups uh, in this world right now. And we have only 10 countries worldwide which are completely free from any conflict. And if, I think everybody's able to read, Germany is not included. We are in several conflicts completely involved because we're part of NATO. So this is the reality. Interesting is that Vietnam who got 40 years bombed or 50 years bombed by the US has no, has no, is not involved. They are somehow become and have a neutral position there in the Asian, in the Asian space. And uh, Switzerland is our uh, wonderland in, in Europe, more or less. We have to face a completely new political reality. These are the guys, these are the new leaders. This is our new leadership program. And I mean our, that we, we cannot escape. We live in this one world, although I put there eight worlds over there uh, on, the, on the right side. And I put on the, very, on, the, on the other side, I put this picture intentionally to show you more or less the situation. Because Trump is completely neglecting that if everybody goes on like that with energy consumptions, with any kind of con consumerism, we need eight more, eight more worlds in the next hundred years. And he's neglecting that. But he's leader, leader of the strongest nation of this world. And I just showed you the 500 companies in the States who are part of it. I know that there is sort of a, a conflict going on in the States right now that the companies sort of run up against Trump and the system. They run up against that, but there's enough other situations. We have a guy here over there who is a killer. He's a personal killer. He killed people in the, in the Philippines. He's no president. We know. I don't want to mention Erdogan right now. He changed the country from being part of Europe into something which is going into a completely <coughs> different uh, situation. And, and uh, um, Kaczynski over there is actually behind the Polish government who is talking about Germany as a fascist country. So um, what kind of reality is that? And what kind of reality are we able to bring into that discussion from our side? I also put on some formats of escapism. I don't know, some of you and even me are sometimes look uh, um, top models or something like that. And uh, it's very attractive in the beginning, but in the meantime, if you look into this worldwide most seen series over here, and you go into the plot, uh, sometimes you think, okay, what kind of escapism is that? What kind of reality show is that? Uh, what is triggered or the bachelor so, show over there where you see completely interesting models between men and women? Um, okay, so this is, this is there and I call that there is a complete group of in, within the creative class which is already becoming a so-called design bourgeoisie. Just simple, they don't give a shit. They're part of it, they're part of the system to make money they're not bothered by the other side. They're not going into this form of reality with which we are completely surrounded and which is heavily political. And they just go into that. And my question is actually, what should we do? 
What is actually our task? What can we do? What kind of values do we have? And do we really fight for these values? And I ask myself critically, how often do I go to any forms of manifestations? When do I write a petition? When do I speak political? When, when, when Charles was here, you know, two, two, two weeks ago, uh, we talked very heavily uh, about sort of the beginning of the creative um, discussion and discourse. There were some, a lot of values involved uh, where we thought, okay, we can change something. But can we really change something? Or do we just talk about our values as a nice, um, as a nice dinner talk or something like that? Is this a sort of more or less an, in German, we say Schulterklopfen. I don't know the word in English, what, what, whatever that is. Yes, what is it? Yes, pat yourself on the back. How nice. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm not sure about that. And I like to give this to the community. But what are actually our visions of tomorrow? <coughs> if you look into the last the 15 years of Hollywood productions, you find that they're actually, apocalypse is sort of the most, um, the most liked drama. So the whole destroyment of the world. And this kind of drama involved with military is sort of, um, yeah, it's a nice mixture. Very successful. It's a very successful model. But what are the models beyond that? What are the models which show us that there's an alternative? And there's a lot of money going into that. And this picture is from 2004. In the meantime, we have 12 years later or 13 years later, and uh, there are even more pictures like that which created um, more of this kind of apocalypse feeling. If we don't have hope, if we don't have any kind of positive alternative, I think you come up with something which is sort of, okay, I have to give up. The world is like this. Those guys over here I showed you before, we have to face like Trump and Erdogan or Putin, they are part of sort of the power system. I'd like to tell you a little quote by Mr. Darendorf, a completely forgotten politician. How many minutes? Five. Great. <laughs> I will go to that. He said that there is sort of a foreign policy of government, but there is a much better foreign policy by people. And that's actually one of my theses. We have to think beyond institutions, and we have to think beyond this kind of um, thinking. And this is our duty, I think, um, because everybody studied that to overcome boundaries, boundaries and certain kinds of orders and systems. So what are the direction of future development? And this is exactly the moment, I think, where the creative class or the creativity starts, because we work with nothing. We work with a white piece of paper, and you all know that, you like it, you love it, to start from nothing, from scratch. So this is a moment, historically, I think, where there's a big shift going on, on a digital level and on a political level. And if you are trained, and if you like your work, I think this is a question you should consider. Because we have in 2015 already nearly 10 billion people living in cities, and it will be more, and the situations will not be um, better. We have a ramp up waste and hunger all over. This is the rest of an apple or something. And we have more than one billion people uh, completely poor somewhere in this world. And the UNO program doesn't work. We know that, but it's, pro it's propaganda at some point. And we also know the latest Pope who becomes nearly a Marxist at some point <laughs> when he talked about capitalism. That this is something we work for, and we also know that this is psychologically, it's a true, it's, one, it's even more right now, it's from last year, that people give out more money than they have, and they are completely seduced by this kind of consumerism, by the systems I told you in the very beginning. The algorithms work like that. We also know that cities are completely overrun by cars, but we have to grow, we have to build more cars, we have to even go into this system. Otherwise, our complete system will break down. And we have a problem of running out of time. Maybe some of you have seen this film Speed. 
where there's this bus driving through Los Angeles and there's a bomb involved and uh, the bus has to run. It has to run. If he stops, he will explode and the whole, all, all the people in the bus will die. So this is actually a nice description about what we do right now. Because we are in the middle of a system which we have to go, we have to keep on going, otherwise your job is gone. But at the same time, while we have to grow to a certain level, we have to change the engine. So the bus is running and we have to change the engine. This is a paradox. But in this kind of paradoxical thinking, I think this is one of the future tasks. This is one of the things we have to face, and uh, I don't have the answer for that, but I think that's, that's what we have to work on, and at least the next generation has to work on. Otherwise, those, those, this kind of eight worlds have to be found somewhere in the universe. So we are actually the guys who have to think. We don't have to wait for anybody outside who gives us any answers. It's everybody of, of you. Everybody here in this room and everybody there somewhere has to come up and actually I like to ask whether this is a possibility out of your initiative which you created. Maybe it's time for a Berlin Manifesto how to use 10% of our creativity to redesign this world in a better way. And we come up with something and collect and uh, summarize that, interconnect that with uh, ideas from different countries and different continents and uh, I think that could be a small fragment of getting into some future which we don't know yet. Dream it up, everybody of you, maybe from tomorrow on and I would like to help. Thank you very much. <laughs>